<laughs> this is going to sound like an unbelievable story, and I honestly couldn't fault anyone for feeling skeptical about this encounter. In hindsight, I don't believe the entity in question meant any harm, and in fact, I believed it to be fairly comforting. Either way, it's the type of story that would make anyone roll their eyes. But I only have my word, and you'll just have to trust me about the veracity of the story. This is something that my brother has been able to confirm, so it wasn't just me who had this experience. At the time, I was about 8 years old when this happened to me. My brother and I were visiting a friend who lived on a farm. I mean, the farm was sprawling. How like it went on for miles, even if in reality, it wasn't as big as we thought as kids. After breakfast, we headed off to the old barn which existed where we, as boys, would attempt to build a go-kart. By building, we mean fix it up a little bit, as it needed some repairs, but only a little bit of minor repairs. About 30 minutes into the repairs, an old man by the name of Johannes approached us and insisted on giving us a hand to help us with the repairs. We didn't remember him saying much, just that he quietly approached us, pointed where he believed there was a problem, and then simply walked away, practically into nothing. I remember that he was dressed as if it was still the 1930s, with either tan or beige overalls. Now, I don't think this man was wearing period clothing. I just think this is the way old folks tend to dress. Very simple, especially farm men. Anyway, we were unable to fix the go-kart, and by the time the man left, we looked and noticed that there was a handprint on the go-kart, like a dirty imprint, like someone was working on the car. We ran back to the farmhouse to reveal our go-kart to my friend's dad. His father commented that we as children, being only seven and eight, me and my friend, would not in a million years fix a defective go-kart, and that he would go ahead and help us put it together. We ended up mentioning that an old man by the name of Johannes came by and tried to help us with the construction, but wasn't able to do much, and even showed him the handprint on the go-kart. My friend's dad was a little puzzled and a bit unnerved. There was no man by the name of Johannes that lived anywhere on the farm, or even close by. Naturally, he decided to scout around the area, make sure there wasn't anybody suspicious stalking our property in the area around it. My dad's friend had been gone around a half hour and then returned soon, whereas dad didn't see anyone. We had left a go-kart on the front porch and entered the living room while all this was going on. As we were all sitting around, his parents included, I looked up and noticed this old man's portrait hanging on the wall. This was the man that was wearing these strange tan and beige overalls. I walked over to the father and confirmed to him that the man on the wall was the same man that helped us with the go-kart. As me and my friend agreed that this was the case, his parents laughed and replied that in that picture was his great-great-grandfather, who passed away more than 20 years ago. Clearly, my friend's parents didn't believe us, but it really did happen. Now I'm 18 years of age, until the day when I visit Richard. We talk about that day, and yes, the portrait is still hanging there. In the meantime, they have added two new siblings, who are according to them also interacting with old Johannes. So I guess maybe they came around and believed us now. I don't think anybody has shared a story so unique, although I previously believe that many of these encounters do exist, but for some reason or another, they never get told. I live a few miles out from London, England, and I'm sure many of you are very aware of the famous stories and reputation that the city has for, for its creepy and unusual hauntings. But what if I told you that there are ghost sightings that happen in the London underground? Well, I can only speak for myself. What this story has to do with my creepy experience with a passenger in the London underground, but I also have another story that is just as creepy in Whitechapel. Now of course, London is an international city, and it's very difficult to get away from people. It's congested and overpopulated, and so there really isn't an opportunity where you get to be alone, even until late hours of the night. But anyway, 
I have a deep fascination with Jack the Ripper and have always wanted to see the area where he committed those crimes. If you aren't aware, Jack the Ripper was an earlier serial killer from London who went after his victims in the Whitechapel district of London, England. This happened in the late 1880s. Unfortunately, this killer's identity to this day has never been identified, and even though we have a better idea of who may be responsible, we still don't truly know who did it. Even though I live fairly close to the area, I never really had a chance to go and explore it, to see it for myself. So I went to decide to explore the area for a bit late at night. That really wasn't my intention, as I had planned on getting there much earlier, but train delays and other homely obligations held me back. Well, I ended up getting there around 8pm at night, in the middle of winter. I was a bit gutted at the fact that I missed the Jack the Ripper tours, which they put together in Whitechapel. I booked the nearby room to stay the night, and decided to just wait the next day for the tours. But while I was there, I wanted to make the most of my night. Well, I decided to have some dinner and proceed walking through the dark and narrow famous alleyways afterwards to sort of explore, but also head back to my rental. At this time it was closer to 2am, maybe closer to just 3, and not one person was in sight on a weekday. Now, Whitechapel isn't what it used to be. Back then, this was considered the poor part of town, not only derelict, but crime ridden. These days it's more of a tourist attraction, so believe me, I was completely safe venturing around this district on my own, even late into the hours of the night, after all the shops had closed up, and everybody disappeared. So as I'm walking around the district, I was stopped by an unusual man who was standing a few feet ahead of me, down in the direction of where I wanted to go. I could see him at the end of the alleyway and started coming closer my way. What are you doing down here? It's late. Go away. I heard the man suddenly yell to me from the distance. The funny thing was, it almost seemed like he would be walking to catch up to me, and my initial reaction was to turn around and walk away from that man. Now obviously, I'm not going to entertain some creepy guy shouting at me from afar. It would have been drug related. I have no idea. I'm not taking any chances. But every time I'd look back, as I got further away from it, he stopped following me after I walked a certain point. I know this because every time I looked back, he'd be further and further away. It was just bizarre. The weird thing was, it wasn't like he was really chasing me either. Oh, five minutes would pass, and I'd figured he'd be gone, and that this would be over with. Not one minute later, this young couple passed me by walking home from the pub, and frighteningly I asked them if I could walk with them. Oh, I felt a little safer crossing back down the road. There's a really creepy guy down that street, and I don't feel safe going down there alone. I said to them, thankfully they were kind enough to let me walk with them. So we walked, and the guy had disappeared. They were wondering why I was walking around at night in this district for no reason, and told me that I shouldn't be doing this, even though Whitechapel is still a safe area. I told them about my fascination with Jack the Ripper, and they proceeded to tell me that the area where I saw that man who shouted at me was the same spot where Mary Tabor, one of Jack's victims, was discovered lifeless in 1888. The thing was, the guy who I noticed in that area wasn't dressed old fashioned. He seems out of place and creepy, but it wasn't like he didn't belong there. He did have a white collared shirt on and a tie, but that was about it. He looked to be in his 40s maybe. That's all I could really make out. He wasn't too far away where I couldn't make him out, but also far enough away where I couldn't clearly see him. All I'm thinking in that moment is that that guy is creepy. I'm going to turn around and hope that he doesn't follow. The connection is what makes this unbelievable. Now, I'm not saying that this was some sort of ghost of Jack. It could have been anyone, or it could have been an actual person. But to me, it really felt a bit ghostly. Sure, I'm into the paranormal, but I'm not one to jump to conclusions. I feel that he was a ghost now that I think about it now, but I didn't really think about it at the time. That was also a weird night, because when I finally got back to my rental to go to sleep, I could have sworn in the big mirror in the flat. I saw a face looking at me in the background of it. Was it the man's face I saw earlier? I have no idea. 
Well, maybe I ended up getting a spirit attachment that night. Because there's one more encounter that I have to mention. I had just returned from leaving on the London Underground Railway. We call it the two. Americans would call it the subway. I changed trains at Leicester Square and managed to get on board on southbound Northern Line just before the doors closed. As I sat down, I realized that there was only one other person in the carriage. I took no notice of it and started looking at my phone and reading up on some websites. As we approached the next station, Charing Cross, I looked up and realized that I was alone. I've tried to tell myself that the other person had just got off the train, but of course he couldn't have. As the doors remained closed until the train stopped in the station, London underground trains and stations are reputed to harbor several ghosts, and despite my often voiced skepticism, I'm now wondering whether I encountered one of them there. So these two experiences may very well be something paranormal. I may have an attachment, or I may be losing my mind. But as I've said, I don't think many have a story like these two encounters. I'm not even sure if anybody would believe me. I wouldn't if others heard this. I wish I could have filmed this with my phone, but I wasn't thinking. I used to deliver papers to the Madison Barracks in Sackett's Harbor, New York. Of course, this is their old military barracks. When I was in one of the buildings to drop off a paper, I was walking up the steps to the apartment when I felt a hand on my shoulder. I turned around, and nobody was there. As I started back down the steps, I saw a figure walking downstairs in front of the door. He was dressed as an old army soldier and had his old rifle over his shoulder. As I walked down the steps towards the door, he turned and looked at me and was suddenly out of sight. I went to open the door and there was no sign of anyone there. What's even crazier was just before I went to open the door, it opened by itself. Ever since then, when I've been in that building, I've gotten the feeling as if I'm being watched or followed by someone. It's not a bad feeling. In fact, it's a very safe feeling. I feel that it's an old soldier still doing his job, like he did back during the War of 1812. Sackett's Harbor, New York is known to be filled with history from the War of 1812. There are a lot of old buildings in Madison Square Barracks that are being remodeled. It's been said that a man with a light can be seen on one of the balconies. There was also another building I went to, which I used to frequently drop newspapers to. I believe this is where the man with the light is seen. I haven't seen the man personally myself, but apparently witnesses have reported seeing a man with a lantern surveying the property, often going back and forth, as if to warn other soldiers of incoming danger. At least, that's what people around here believe is actually happening. I feel very safe when I'm at the Madison Barracks because I know I'm being watched over by the long since dead soldiers that once lived here. I believe they still patrol the barracks to this day who keep them safe. I know they're watching over me and are keeping me company when I'm in the buildings that are now used for apartments. I would like to hear from anyone who has ever been to Madison Barracks in Sackett's Harbor, New York. Dad was told he had cancer in May of 1999. He had always taken care of my mom. Mom had been sick most of my life. Dad passed away on July 14th of 1999. The ball dropped in my lap into what to do with my mom. He had always asked me not to put her in a nursing home. So I left my job and brought mom to live with me and my husband Sam. The night my dad died, we went back to my parents' house to stay. My son Brad and my husband got a beer and went out to the patio to eat. My dad had never drank a beer with Sam, and Sam took the beer and made a toast to my dad saying, here is to the beer we never had together, Walter. At the time they popped the cans of beer, the two coach lights in the garage flashed blue, and shots of blue came from them, and then they went out. Sam and Brad never did take a drink of their beers. After the funeral, we were able to put our thoughts together. We brought mom to our home to live, we have a manufactured home so no one had ever lived in it but us. Things had been so crazy in our lives that I felt I had not been giving my husband attention he needed. I made a bed in front of the TV after mom was put to bed, and a little soft music. 
Hing started to heat up when we heard this very loud thump on the wall behind us. At that same time, my mom says in a loud voice, Did you just see a man coming down the hallway? Needless to say, the night was over for Sam and I. A week later, Sam and I had been in bed when Sam says, Deb, Deb, all I could say was I see it. There was a shadow on the side of the bed and then moved to my side. We couldn't believe what we had just seen. The next morning, my mom says to us, Did you see your dad last night? We both said yes. The phone rang, and it was my son who was with a friend down in southern Illinois. He says to me, Mom, last night I woke up, and Grandpa was standing over me right by my bed. The only thing I could say was I know he was here also. Now during this time, Mom became very sick and was put into the hospital. She was put in a room across from where my dad had been. She said she had heard him calling her, and that's when she got out of bed and tried walking to the room across from her. She fell and broke her arm. I woke up at home to see her ceiling fan lights on, and the fan on high speed. The phone rings, and it's the hospital telling me of my mom breaking her arm. Other strange things started to happen like lights coming on in parts of the house, TV coming on. I think the strangest of all was New Year's Eve 1999. My dad had always been so worried about the year 2000. He was worried what if mom wasn't able to get her pills and her insulin shots. Sam had to work and I was watching a show on TV. When the clock struck midnight, the movie I was watching that was in color went to a black and white room with two men in it. There was a desk and both men had the same clothes. One looks at the other and said, are you Mr. Wilson? The other man said, yes. My parents' last name was Wilson. This froze me to my chair not being able to move. Then the movie I was watching was right there before my eyes, back in color. I was hit with the flu bug really bad in the winter of 2000, as I laid there in bed crying because I just couldn't take care of my mom, as I felt I needed to. I felt this soft kiss on my lips, and a hand touched my cheek. Mom was in her bed and couldn't walk, and I was the only other person there. Mom started to see something sitting beside her bed at night. He had a potty chair in her room. She said the man sat there for hours and looked at her. One night she screams out the name Sam. Sam, Sam. Oh God, he is putting me by my arm. As we ran to her room to turn on the light, you could see the fear in her eyes. Sam asked where the man was, and she says right beside you by the stairs. We didn't have stairs in our home. I felt so bad for mom, as I started to think dad was there to take care with him. I called a paranormal group from southern Illinois to come to the house, but was asked by my son not to do this. Things was just too far gone in my mind, and I needed help to keep my mind. Mom was put in the hospital so Sam and I could take a break. She had a stroke the next day and was in a coma. I was at the hospital every day with her. The 4th of July came upon us, and I told Sam I was not going to the hospital that day. He was getting ready for the second shift job. I started thinking, yes, I will go, even if it was for a short time. I go to the hospital around 4 p.m. and was sitting there holding her hand, and she passed away. I think she was waiting on me to come to her so she wouldn't be alone. As she was taking her last breath, Mom looked to the door, opened her eyes and smiled. All the pain that had aged her face all those 36 years was turned to soften and it was free of pain. She was now with Daddy and I saw it in my heart. Dad and Mom had been married for 50 years. During that year I had tried to get grass to grow in Dad's grave. It wouldn't do anything. Just dirt. After mom was laid to rest beside him, the green grass grew. Dad died July 14th, 1999. Mom died July 4, 2000. God, I miss them both. But I know they are both watching over us together now. Strange things still happen from time to time. And I just kind of gave a smile and said, okay, I will be careful. You see... It's not the first time I've had strange things happen to me like this. It has happened most of my life. It's like a draw power knowing someone is going to pass away in my dreams or a smell. I would love to talk to you about these things. In 1989, 
I lived as a single mom in a two-story town hall. This was in Brea, Kentucky. My bedroom was upstairs and had one window overlooking my front door and the parking lot. David, my next door neighbor who shared his porch with me, one small cement porch with one step up leading to his door into mine. He was number seven and I was number eight. One time early between two and three o'clock, I had just startled myself awake after a disturbing dream. I just finished writing it all down in a dream journal and had turned off my bedside lamp. I lay there in darkness with my bedroom window as a nightlight. A bit of streetlight shone through the slightly elevated shade. And if a car happened to go by, I'd see a quick flash of headlights roam through my bedroom walls. The roads were mostly empty and it was all stillness outside. My window was partly open and I remember the sound of wind and an occasional instinct amidst all the quiet. It was summer, or maybe the end of summer, and the fresh air smelled like honeysuckle. As I lay there trying to fall back asleep, I suddenly hear the low growl of a car engine in the parking lot below. It idled for a few minutes and then turned off. There was silence. Next, the click of a door handle, then the sound of a door creaking open and slamming shut. I heard shoes hitting the pavement. They had loud distinct heels on them, pacing each step like I would imagine a sharply dressed woman would do. Clop, clop, coming closer to David and my porch. They made a distinct noise, which echoed in the night air. They walked just below my window. I wondered if the person would knock on David's door. Or mine. There was a pregnant pause as I listened for the knock. I guessed the knock would be on David's door, as he was a big late night partier and had frequently night friends. The knock came on my door. I heard it loud and bellowing through my open window from right below it, and simultaneously, it echoed through my apartment, five knocks on my front door, sharp and determined. I immediately leaped out of bed and was at the window for a few seconds later. I yelled down to the visitor, I'll be right there. I had several friends or family it could be, despite this odd hour, so I wasn't concerned. I turned from the window and bounded down my stairs, in the dark, and sprung open my front door. I opened it part way, and then all the way, only darkness, just an empty porch. There was no car in the parking lot, as far as my eyes could see. Wind howled through the trees, it just shrieked past my door and blew branches across the pavement. I shuddered, not from cold, but from the lightning bolt of the creepy chills that were traveling like ice down my spinal cord. I shut the door again and then locked it. Then I stood there for a minute or two and checked the lock again. Slowly I moved again, back up the stairs again, taking each step backward, keeping watch my front door. Then stood there for a minute or two and checked the lock again. I moved slowly back up the stairs again, taking each step up backward, keeping my watch on my front door. About four years ago when I lived with my mother and her boyfriend in an apartment, I was sleeping on the love seat in the living room, and I had a stack of pillows and blankets close to my head. It was about 12 a.m., and suddenly the pillows and blankets fell over. I shrugged it off. There were a lot of pillows and blankets, and the pile was a bit lopsided. That was, until I got up in the morning. When I woke up, I saw that the pillows and blankets had been made into a little pallet on the floor next to me. Also, in that apartment, it was about 10 p.m. I was trying to get some sleep, and I saw a lady in one of those button-up high-collar dresses from a long time ago. I was a little bit freaked, but when I saw her, I was so scared. 
but kind of happy to see her anyway. Also, about two years ago, I was living in a home with my father and my stepmother, and I was walking to my room, and that's when I saw a blonde lady laying on our couch. She was wearing a long, light blue dress. At first, I thought it might have been my stepmother. Then I realized that she didn't have a light, long blue dress. That was when I looked back, and the lady wasn't there anymore. And my stepmother was all the way at the other end of the house on the computer. This time it happened to my father. He was sitting in his chair watching television, and for some reason he looked behind him and saw this little old lady with her hands in her hips, giving him a disproving look. I'd also see things disappear and turn up in weird places. At first I thought I'd done it. I'm always leaving stuff in odd places, like my shoes in the bathroom behind the towels. But then I realized even I didn't leave things in that weird of places. Once I lost my house keys, I knew I left them on my bed, and I was getting ready for bed, and I was getting all the crap off my bed. I realized that my keys weren't there. I looked for them for days, but I never even found them. That is until about six months later. We were moving out of the house and my dad was moving the big desk out of my room. And there were my keys. There is no way that I could have kicked them under the desk by accident. It had this weird decoration on the front. The only way that it could have gotten there was from the back. And that was also impossible. My desk was too close to the wall for that. This also happened to my father a few months ago. It was really late at night or really early in the morning. I don't know, but my father woke up and then he saw his father standing in his room. He called my aunt and she told him what happened. This happened about five months ago to me. I was sitting in the church during the prayer. I don't know why, but I looked up and I saw my best friend's dad standing right there, which I knew to be impossible because he had been dead for about two years before the occurrence. This happened about four months ago. I was really late. I mean really late. I was having trouble trying to sleep, and I was looking at my window, or rather glaring. But yeah, I was glaring at my window, and I looked at the end of the bed and saw this weird demon-looking creature Anyways, I totally freaked. I mean, you don't see these weird little creatures every day, you know. Well, ever since I've seen this thing, my favorite clothes have been disappearing. At first, I thought they might have been under my bed or in my closet. But they're not. There's nothing under my bed. And I've been through my closet twice. Do you know what that little freaky creature might have been? About three months ago. I was at my friends, and they have crosses everywhere. I mean everywhere. The reason being is that they have problems. These weird glowing like orb ghost things. Well, my friend and her sister and I were sitting on her bed. We were just talking about Stephen King movies and then I say, have you seen it? And then we hear a creepy voice that says yes. We freaked out. We all jumped into the middle of the bed and didn't move for a long time. While the glowing orbs or thingies that we mentioned are supposed to be ghosts, I suppose. Because like, a lot of people have died in that house. My friend was up late one night, watching TV, and she looks out her window, and she sees three glowing heads. Well, one day, I had come home with her after school, so she get me a ride to church. I put my backpack in the middle of her bed and sat on the floor. That way I could watch some televisions before we could go. That's when she was on the other side of the room, by the window, where she saw the glowing heads. And all of a sudden, my backpack flies off the bed and into her closet. It was more like it moved a little bit. And suddenly it was in her closet. It's kind of hard to explain. About a year ago, 
I was in my friend's grandmother's bathroom. My friend had to shave her legs. And that's when I see this old dog lying on the floor. And that's when I asked, did you have a dog that died? And she was like, yeah. How do you know? Then that's when I said, cause it's lying there right on the floor underneath the sink. Turns out that they have several portals, so to speak, in her house. And then there's a ghost in a Ouija board. We don't mess with that. While I was stationed in Germany, I got married to my wife in Denmark. We stayed in a little nice hotel that was built in the 1400s. We stayed a total of three nights and never had a problem until the last night. Late in the last night, I was lying in bed with my new wife. We were both facing a wall away from the door. I said something along the lines of, I'll always keep you safe. And at that moment, an overwhelming fear came over me. At the same time, my wife said, why did you just say that? It had no real reason. But she described to me that she was feeling the same thing I was. And we were able to determine that the source of our unexplained fear was coming from the doorway right behind us. Neither I nor my wife wanted to turn to see if anything was there. When I finally mustered up the courage to look, I was convinced that I was going to be looking directly into the eyes of the devil, but nothing was there. And shortly after the fear subsided, I have jumped out of planes and been to combat twice, but I never felt as scared as I was that night. Please take a moment to watch this video, leave it a like, leave it a comment. Don't click until the end of the video and just share with all your heart's content. Comment the below and let me know which story you like the most. We're back with the October edition. Well, it's almost October. It's September. But we're back with the almost Halloween edition of Phantom of Darkness Ghost Stories. We're going to have long stories, short stories, everything that you can ever possibly dream of. Long videos, short videos, all the videos in the world. So love you guys. Please share. Please comment. These videos are doing horrible um, in terms of views. So please support. Let me know you actually like these videos and you want to see more of them thank you for your viewership and i'll see you in the next video love you